Yes, thank, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> I guess it's a little bit of a sparse room, but I think we have a competition across the hallway. I'll try to see if I can keep yeah. everybody awake uh, today. So uh, I'm a neuroscientist and I work on, um, I've been thinking for about 30 years of, about the problem of free will and I've, I've studied, I have graduate degrees in, uh, sorry, is that better? I have graduate degrees in physics, philosophy. Uh, I was a lawyer for about a decade and now uh, I've been working in neuroscience for about 11 years. And I've been trying to figure out and advance the problem of, of, of free will. I used to quantify it. And the last uh, year or so, I realized that actually the problem of free will is really related to, to whole brain emulation. I'm going to try to explain to you why that is the case. Uh, I took a little bit more uh, on this week than I planned. Today I'm going to talk about uh, just an overview of, of, of whole brain emulation and what lo-fi uh, whole brain emulation is, at least from my view. And I'm trying to do these evening uh, mini workshops. I'm hoping people come. I think about 15, 20 people signed up. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be quite informal, and we're supposed to just talk about um, you know, what the community thinks whole brain emulation is about and what it should be. So tonight we'll talk about theoretical things, like what the heck are emulators, what should they be. Um, and then tomorrow night and the day after, maybe we'll come back into one. I'm not sure yet if people are motivated to come at 7 o'clock. <laughs> Uh, late in this week, uh, but maybe we'll combine it all in one, like a, 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 what's the bottlenecks, experimental neurotech bottlenecks to whole brain emulation. Okay, so the layout of my talk today, I'm definitely going to touch a little bit on what whole brain emulation is. I think there's not been a, a lot of formal description of that. Definitely talk about structural to functional whole brain emulation. My initial roadmap for, for what I think really uh, is a promising avenue, especially since language models have shown so much promise, and of course a little bit, bit of a brief overview on um, on the workshops in the next three days. All right. So the theme of my talk is, I, I won't really come back to this until the end, but whole brain emulation is related to two other fields. Uh, one of them is, of course, what I think is the most interesting question in the world is, do we have free will, maybe consciousness, ep epiphenomenal, et cetera. I won't talk a lot about that, um, but it's a very interesting and, 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 a, and a substantial drive of my research for the last at least decade. Uh, and the AI safety uh, question, which is, you know, uh, can we prevent X risks from AGIs? I think emulators bring, at least in my mind, uh, these three topics together. I'm going to try to convince you a little bit that is the case. Whole brain emulation is, 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 is the idea that emulators are essentially a, way, a digitized version of the mind. How do emulators relate to, to neuroscience of free will? Well, essentially, if you can build models of free action, which essentially what, what emulators are, there'll be these organisms that, that can do things that uh, are very much like humans or other types of organisms, mammals. You're going to demystify a lot of the free will uh, notion. If you have stochastic models of behavior, then that's kind of going to quantify what it means to be free. And again, I've written a lot on this. Um, I probably won't go talk a lot about it today. And of course, uh, if, we can if we can have these kinds of human-like um, emulators, then they, we, we might have another path to understandable and controllable AGI. I think making emulators is an extraordinary um, time in, I would say, in human history, but science for sure. We're, we're, kinda, we're trying to do something pretty pretty extraordinary. We're trying to make copies of what, whatever we are, conscious experience, et cetera. It's, there's never been a time like this. My research goal, I'm going to talk about it at various parts of my presentation, is really to generate a gigantic behavior, neuron behavior data set. It's, it's, it's exactly the opposite of what the, uh, the structural people are trying to, uh, to segment um, uh, brains. Uh, and I'm also trying to convert the problem of lo-fi brain emulation into a tractable neurotech problem. I'm still working a little bit on that. Interacting with the community for the last few months uh, has been very helpful. So what is uh, whole brain emulation? I think um, I'm going to refer a lot to the Sandberg and Bostrom 2008 uh, WB roadmap. If you haven't read it, read it. It's, it, it's quite nice and digestible. Uh, probably an hour will we'll really catch you up very well to what the field is. I'll refer a lot to it. You'll see a lot of their quotes. Uh, this is one of their quotes. The possible one-to-one -one modeling of the function of the human brain, whatever that means. Um, and the, the fundamental uh, proposal at the time was in 2008 was, hey, we just need to scan the brain. Uh, we have to get a very high fidelity structural scanner image of the brain using perhaps electron microscopy uh, and, then, and, then, uh, and then simulate it. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. The lo-fi, the functional uh, WB, is something that's kind of emerged in the last uh, little while. It's like, hey, can we just go the other way around and just look at what the brain does in, in, a, in, a, in a model organism for me, I work a lot with rodents, uh, and then try to model that, try to try to build a, um, a top-down or a, a functional uh, version of, of that. Uh, and, and now again, because these time series models, uh, language models, foundation models are so powerful, this seems more and more uh, possible. What whole brain emulation may not be, I, I put not in quotes because again, I'm not the I'm not the Moses of whole brain emulation. I'm just this is just a position. Uh, you, you know, uh, I'm just going to make the argument that computational neuroscience. Uh, is, has substantially different goals. They're interested in mechanisms and explanations. This is a very, very famous reductionist um, diagram. I think Freiburg, uh, Freiburg, I think it's from 91, 93, I don't remember exactly, but it's definitely uh, uh, Terry Szyzhnowski and uh, Patricia Churchill, big people in comp computational neuroscience have um, had this idea that this is what we want. We want complete reductionist 
uh, models of, of, um, of the central nervous system. I add consciousness there because I think there's quite a few people actually in neuroscience that are very frustrated with the progress of neuroscience. They think that we really haven't made much progress in neuroscience. If really the fundamental thing we want to explain is consciousness, we've done uh, some progress in there, but really not, no, no real fundamental um, progress. And I, I propose here that basically the map looks something like this. We, we have mechanisms for very low kind of um, low-level systems, molecular essential, uh, essential things that happen inside the cell. We, we understand quite well, again, they're stochastic models. But as you move up the, the ladder, we really don't really understand mechanisms. And uh, what's been happening in the last, I worked at Columbia University in the Zuckerman Institute, there's a, there's a theory center there and there's 80 uh, computational and theoretical neuroscience trainees. That's just, it's like probably an order of magnitude than the next uh, probably a bunch of them, except maybe UCL, et cetera. So everybody in there for the last 10 years have been increasingly moving away from mechanistic uh, closed form expressions. Neural networks are becoming, uh, basically they're, they're starting to fit somewhere in our models. We, we, we're giving up in some sense in computational neuroscience to just really make it a very uh, simple way to think about it. And in fact, somebody showed this yesterday, this LFATS paper is, is just that. We really don't understand dynamics in the motor cortex, even though, even though they're kind of simple. Um, for a very overtrained task in a monkey. We, we basically have to give that up to, uh, to a recurrent neural network and our own encoder. So the, in contrast, the whole brain emulation is, is something like emulation or replication of, of something like a dynamic uh, system that does things. Uh, and the original, um, um, excuse me, scale that was proposed, probably we want to capture uh, emulation. We probably want to capture spike in neural networks, uh, electrophysiology, meta metabolome, somewhere there. I think that was the consensus way back in 2008 that that's the level of granularity we want to emulate. We're not so much interested in, in explicit mechanisms uh, for whole brain emulation. Um, this is a mandatory slide. Again, I think probably some of you already have strong feelings on this, but brain emulation is really a logical endpoint of computational neuroscience. I would say it's the logical endpoint of all of science and, 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 and even more than that. If we can, if we can do this, then we're, we're really in a different um, point in civilization. It's, of course, also well, good science along the way. We're going to learn a lot of things. We're going to be able to do experimentation, study the brain in, in, in ways that we've never really um, been able to. Uh, there's economic value. Again, these are all quotes that are coming from, from uh, Sanders and, uh, and Bostrom and digital morality, etc. However, there's this uh, problem of uh, whole brain emulation for AI safety and digital minds to compete with AGIs. I think more and more people are thinking that this might be a way to control or compete with AGIs. I've been writing a little bit on this for the last uh, couple of years, and I think that generating whole brain emulation data really is increasing our X risk. Uh, it's not uh, a trivial issue to, uh, um, to, to figure out what happens when you, when you make extremely good, powerful models of, of human behavior prediction, right? This is really um, not trivial at all. So I have this, this paper has been published now in ICML this year. It, it explains basically that the, the, the gold standard of AI alignment is intent alignment. Align, you know, get AI systems to do what humans intend them to do. That is absolutely wrong. That, that, is, that is a catastrophic goal because intention is a manipulable uh, value-driven concept that we haven't really solved. It basically goes to the, to the science of free will and science of agency. If you're interested in these types of topics, you can see the paper now uh, in ICML. Um, so I'll do, I hope, hopefully I won't uh, do too poor of a, of a, of a job in explaining uh, structural uh, whole brain emulation. I don't really work in this field. The idea is roughly to scan the brain using microscopy or some other imaging technique, hopefully at a very, very low, um, high resolution. Uh, then reconstruct the brain uh, and then simulate it. Uh, pick your favorite uh, compartmentalization model. So you take the cells. This is old stuff. Again, this is from uh, the, the roadmap. Uh, you can break up each cell into little compartments or very many compartments or cables or whatever you want to, whatever model you want to do. And then distribute these channels, these dynamical properties across the cell, up and down, uh, and then run them into some simulation. And uh, although I haven't done that work, I've done a lot of work with the Allen Institute uh, where I worked during my PhD. Um, and their approach, and the Blue Brain Project project was, was, was somewhat similar where they would take uh, real neurons from, this is from uh, somatosensory cortex of rat. They put them in a, obviously sacrifice the animal and slice the brain and they would record these neurons. They would patch clamp them inside a, a dish. And they would essentially electrode, uh, this was, uh, by the way, this was amazingly difficult. This is very, very difficult to patch from the same neuron at three points. It's very, very difficult. And uh, Henry Markram was a genius at that. And I think that's why he ended up getting so much money for the Blue Brain Project. Uh, but in any case, they were able to, to patch clamp a single neurons in multiple points and build pretty decent models, like bi biophysical models. And the Blue Brain Project in 2015, when they released this first kind of patch of uh, network, had about 207 morpho-electrical neuron types. But that means that there was 207 of these neuron, unique neurons they were able to patch. It took them years. 
Uh, and they put them together, and they made many copies of them, about 30,000 initially. There's much more, much bigger models now, of course. Uh, and then uh, they connected them using some stochastic rules. There's an entire thesis written not just on this. I, I read it. Um, it's quite fascinating. Uh, all the cool ideas you can come up with to solve these connectivity problems. Um, and I just put here some cool videos. This is some videos from my time at the Allen Institute. Uh, I was uh, hired there to do a lot of stuff, uh, and I played a lot of a lot of um, played play a lot with the UCSD Supercomputer Center running these simulations. Uh, these are like 20,000 cells connected. Uh, these are mouse uh, visual cortex neurons connected. They're about 100 to 200 compartment um, individual. Each neuron has about that many compartments. They're connected using some stochastic rules, uh, and they can do things. But uh, do they amount to to uh, to visual cortex? Probably not. Uh, they've, uh, I should also say that the answer has made really great progress in the last decade, but um, the problem is very, very far from solved. They were, they were just aiming for the mouse visual cortex. We're not even close. Um, now, I want to introduce lo-fi whole brain emulation in rodents, and I would just caveat that this is my approach. Uh, others may have other uh, approaches. Uh, my, 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 my thinking has been like this. Essentially, it's, it's an fMRI problem. Think of the brain as some kind of voxelation or parcellated uh, piece of tissue, and uh, essentially, uh, well, if you can sample from the whole brain, and everything's going to be fantastic, but we don't have the technology. I just want to basically add a point on this on this map of lo-fi emulation. So record as many sites as you can with the current technology, model, uh, excuse me, so you record the neural areas and the behavior of a live organism moving in some box in some complex environment, and then the emulator becomes some kind of joint um, uh, probability model of that animal, and then increase the resolution, how many increase, increasingly uh, record from more and more sites and see how much better your emulator gets. So hopefully by the time to get to this kind of dark, very high, uh, um, many, you know, thousands of, of sites, your emulator gets a little bit closer to the real biological organism. It's a pretty simple roadmap and it's actually not that far from systems and computational neuroscience. And what emulators do, well, they, they kind of predict next behavior neural states from history. So from both the behavior and the um, and the neural state of the animal, you feed many, many of these things into an emulator, and hopefully uh, you can study how the granularity of your problem and the, the complexity of your task for the, for the live organism uh, um, can help you uh, make this uh, prediction. I'll make two quick points. One of them is in the high granularity limit. So if we keep going and going and going to the point where we record atoms and 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 uh, proteins, etc., well, we're just we're just doing what the computational neuroscience is doing. We're, but except except we're coming from the functional perspective. I think the point number two is just as important, and I'm trying to build this field uh, from my perspective. But there's a couple of other people, which is that we want to motivate. I would like to show that this is this is workable, and I would like to. Um, motivate others to make technology for this to work, um, and we can actually grow this this uh, this field. Um, this is a, a conceptual slide. I like to just basically say that one advantage of low phi uh, whole brain animation is that we may not really care about all these idiosyncrasies of evolution. If we can figure out at some scale, maybe you know this scale actually already gives us enough of a mo of an emulator that captures all the behaviors we're interested in, and maybe some neural types of states. Uh, excuse me, conscious types of states. Then maybe we can stop. So we want to input uh, the focus in uh, lo-fi uh, whole brain emulation is essentially on on this input output uh, causality, not necessarily the architecture. Some of you saw that Butlin paper from last year, the philosopher that talked a lot about whether language models, uh, architectures are starting to approach those uh, hypothesized by consciousness theories. Um, and I and we can stay completely away from that. We don't have to engage with that. We just have to look at input output and causality. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about this tonight. Actually, this is from the paper that I um, that I just put out. And this is super weird stuff that happens in the brain that I would love to just talk about this. Maybe I'll mention this a little bit more tonight, but the brain, it, it, it's quite weird. You can actually do things like deep electrical stimulation, and, and people have talked about this yesterday as well, where you can put an electrode in and you can generate phenomenal states. People can experience smells, uh, tingling, et cetera, visuals, just from like a, 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 an electrode activating some localized piece, piece of tissue. That, that really should not be happening, right? If you think of how complex the brain is, you, you, the, I think the folk intuition that I had and everybody probably would have without knowing this literature is that in order to have such a complex representation of a something, it's a bunch of distributed places that have to be activated in some specific sequence and these other things don't have to be online, and, but it doesn't seem to happen that way. It seems like it's, it's just very weird that you can do exogenous or external activation of neural states. And this is what I claim that may allow us to have things like supercomputers that may also generate conscious, uh, conscious states. Um, so I'm, I'm reaching towards the end now. I'm going to talk about uh, briefly the kind of three concepts that I think um, for me drive uh, lo-fi whole brain emulation. One of them is uh, this idea where we talk about a scale. Uh, we're trying to build an emulator. The performance of an emulator is, is what I have here in blue and red. Uh, you can look at either. It doesn't really matter. I separated them because I think neural emulation and consciousness is a little bit too 
more of a complicated process, but the idea here is you collect data uh, at some granularity, synapses, single neurons, or EEG, or just online behavior, and then you build a model of the organism you're, you're studying, or organisms, plural. Uh, and just for reference, this is not that, that weird. It's basically what Google and all these social media companies have been doing. They've been building models of behavior just looking at your social media um, output, and they, and, they, and they can do decent prediction for certain types of things. Maybe they'll predict 1% of the time you're going to click on something. Um, and just a side note again, I'm, I, historically I've been very, very worried about what happens when biometric data starts to be collected, especially real-time neural data and biometric data, and these, and these organizations start to, to, to use it. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But the idea is pretty simple. It's basically um, build, build, <laughs> build this empirical uh, curve. I don't know what it looks like. I'm going to try to collect some data around here. This is the first set of experiments in the next couple of years I'm going to do. Uh, it's, uh, it's also not going to be complete. Um, it's going to be sparse data. I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that. And I can contrast this with how language models evolve, essentially. They basically, they, they also have a curve, a performance curve, where they, they, they can be perf perfect uh, AGI, that they can behave exactly like humans. Uh, the more and more data we feed them, there's extra risks, probably something on this curve. I really don't know where it is. I don't know where the perfect behavior or consciousness occur, but it looks something like that. And the alien versus predator moment here is, uh, do, you, do we want the whole brain emulators to become AGI first, or do we want a uh, lar large language model or these kinds of uh, more difficult alien type of organisms to, to, to breach AGI first? We, we really don't know, but um, I think it's a, it's a question the community is asking. Um, the second uh, thing driving my research is really the naturalism behavior. I really uh, feel very strongly about this for a number of reasons, but uh, there's a bunch of very clear evidence in the, in the literature that essentially when you put a monkey in front of a screen and you hit it with like visual stimuli and, and decision making process, you're getting, in terms of the neural states that the brain goes in, it's a very small portion of all the neural states that would be a, present in spontaneous. So if the monkey just sits there and its brain just goes places, it's way bigger neural state. This is a uh, non, um, multi-dimensional scale. It's a very non-linear plot as well. And if you shuffle it, um, also it's like, you know, incre incredibly large. Um, so we, we really don't know what these spaces look like. We probably, systems neuroscience and computational neuroscience, we're doing a good job at figuring out these little bits, but these ones um, are our way. And, and, then, and then the freely moving animal running around is, is, even, is even larger. Uh, the other thing that I work a lot on, I'm not, I would love to talk to you as well about, is this weird thing called the readiness potential. Basically, voluntary action. So when you don't have an animal sitting in a room uh, being hit with all these stimuli, and being food deprived or water deprived or joy deprived, and all these other things that we do to animals, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the brain does weird things. So there's a, there's a thing called the readiness potential that we discovered about 60 years ago. It, it looks like your brain is generating a lot of neural activity right before you're aware of something, right? It's like a buildup. Uh, it's so crazy that it's actually... We, we picked it up in the 60s, actually even the late 50s. So it's so big that that technology from way back then you could pick it up. You don't need to be like super specifically um, inside the brain and do things. It's fascinating. It really raises questions of like who's deciding and, 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 and a lot of ethical interesting questions. I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, if you were interested, let me know. The third, comp uh, the third comp concept here is ju it's just leveraging big data. I don't think I need to tell the room much about this. It's basically uh, just keep adding data. Hopefully, we can replicate some of the scaling properties of, of, of language models for whole brain emulation. So tonight, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to talk about, actually, I'm going to give an introduction to the theoretical and weirdness of whole brain emulations. I'm hoping, I'm also going to talk a little bit about emulator theory, which is this preprint I put out. I really won't bore you too much. I just want to show you a couple of ideas from it. Uh, and then I'm going to hopefully try to have, I don't know how many people are going to come, I think 15 to 20 people signed up, but uh, we'd like to, I'd like to have maybe some small groups, two, three people that are feel passionate about any one of these one particular topics. Tell me what you think, right? It's, it's, it's really going to be a, an open discussion and, um, yeah, uh, and, and trying to figure out, we're trying to create this field. Uh, and and it's, it also refers to, it could also obviously cover structural hi-fi uh, emulators. Uh, the workshop tomorrow, I'll talk about what I'm planning on doing uh, more and what the bottlenecks are. So I'm going to talk about these open field arenas where, where little animals, little rodents are going to be running around and be collecting data for, for days or weeks at a time. Uh, I'm going to talk about the electrodes and loggers and amplifiers, really fun stuff. There's neurotech opportunities here. If, if you are software, especially electric, uh, electro engineering minded, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, I advise people, sometimes young people on, uh, younger trainees on, on, on types of programs they can go into uh, to, to advance these technologies. There's a lot of cool stuff that can be done in the near term, I think, in the next couple of years, including standardizing these things uh, and, and, and scaling to many, many arenas to build our data sets. But in the midterm and long term, we really need to do other things like increase the density of electrode arrays that uh, are a little bit more expensive. This is probably in the order of, um, um, you know, million, millions, uh, amplifiers, hundreds of thousands, and battery density of things that are a little bit cheaper, but, uh, but they also need to be done. And the last but not least is really this computational framework that I'm going to talk about um, 
which is basically says, you know, as you, as you scale up and you collect from more and more animals, the types of data sets that you can get. And basically, the, these data sets start to approach the data set sizes that um, these increasingly successful models have been built on. And, and it's like, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point of, of, of interest. Um, right, so the last slide is essentially, excuse me, um, whole brain emulation with digitizing minds emulators are possible, uh, at least conceptually. Um, functional lo-fi whole brain emulation, I think is gotten, getting a huge boost, in my opinion, from the success of language models and these time series. I, I really did not think in my lifetime we would get such incredible uh, time series models. Uh, there's a few outstanding challenges, but there's nothing really, really prohibitory that blocks us uh, forever. Uh, and that's it, and invite, invite you guys to come to, tonight. I promise I won't keep you there for two hours, but um, you know, it, it's gonna be, as long as uh, people are interested in talking, I will definitely be there. And uh, yeah, thank you to the Foresight Institute as well.